uh, but it's five after two, so um, I think we can. I, I think we can get started. I, I, so also in the room with me, I'll start. I'm Heather Hall with the Washington Department of Prep, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm the Intergovernmental Ocean Policy Manager. Um, uh, go ahead, Robert. Robert Morgan. I'm the Electronic Monitoring Program Manager. And Jamie. Uh, Jamie Fuller, and I'm the uh, Coastal Shellfish Data Manager for our group. Great. And so we'll just take care of everybody in the room. I've got Jack and Lois Johnson um, from Willapa Bay and Kevin Marks. Kevin Marks. Okay. Hi, Kevin. That's who we've got in the room. And I just wanted to let you know also that uh, we are recording this meeting. Uh, so it will be available to folks that couldn't attend today. Uh, we'll post it to our website, but just also need you to know that we are recording the meeting. Um, I'll run through the folks that I can see uh, that are on the meeting. <laughs> so we've also got um, Carly Adams, who is um, working in the e electronic monitoring program that we have here. Um, and we've got Captain Chadwick on the line and Lorna Vargo from Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then I see... Um, We've also got Kelly Corbett from ODFW, and Kelly, and uh, Greg McMillan, Jennifer Custer, Larry Thiebik, Matt Gilman, um, Michelle Conrad, and I think that's it. And then we've got a couple people that have called in, and I don't have my little cheat sheet, so I'm going to ask you to just um, introduce yourself when I call the last four numbers of your um, Dale Beasley. Uh, is here. So welcome, well, y'all. We're just introducing ourselves. Um, Guess I don't have to do that. <laughs> I did that for you. Um, so I've got 1305. Uh, somebody with the. Matt, Matt, Matt B is the 1305. Oh, got you, Matt. Um, and then I've got 4384. Hillary Bearden. Okay, thanks, Hillary. And 2855. Shane Reeves. Okay, thanks, Shane. And we just had um, uh, Larry Conklin join us in the in the meeting room here. So uh, that's it. So thanks everybody for being here. Um, I'll just get us started with a quick introduction. Um, really, we're here to give you an update on electronic monitoring. It's something we've been talking about for several years, really. Um, and it started back when we started looking for some grant opportunities in around 2015 to, to test some systems um, that might work for our fishery. Uh, it wasn't until 2020 that we had finally secured funding for electronic monitoring. Um, but as many of you know, uh, in 2015, Quinault uh, has had implemented electronic monitoring for their fleet. Um, so just say that to let you all know, we really have been thinking about electronic monitoring well before we started responding to the whale entanglement issue, although um, we find that the needs are complementary um, for both of that. So, so our plan for today is Did I just mess it up? Maybe. Not working. So long, Okay. Can all of you that are joined by computer um, see our presentation? Okay. We can. Okay. All right. Thank you. So uh, this is this is uh, the plan for today. What we're going to walk through. I, I just touched on the purpose of the meeting. The primary purpose. We went through the introductions. After that, we're going to spend a fair amount of today uh, time, um, which is allotted to rules that we're considering. Um, or that we're proposing through the Fish and Wildlife Commission in 2023. Electronic monitoring is really the, 
the big item in that rule package. And um, there are some other proposals that we'll walk you through, but we'll really spend the bulk of our time talking about electronic monitoring. Um, the last time we talked about this was in the fall, where we held a series of three um, industry meetings to start um, introducing you all to some of these rule proposals, including electronic monitoring and some of the other work that we've been doing. And then we'll um, conclude this afternoon uh, with an update on um, catch for this, this season, and then we'll um, plan to adjourn at 4.30. So we've got a good amount of time to work through this. And so um, why electronic monitoring? Uh, really, we, we need um, real-time spatial data uh, for our fishery, and some of the um, primary needs are to confirm uh, catch area reporting, enforce uh, special management area closures. Uh, we can enforce other area closures, such as uh, those that we might need in the event of a biotoxin um, event where we have one area that's required to have uh, for crab to be eviscerated. We can really ensure that we are protecting public health if we can manage those types of lines. Um, it will also give us a really good um, idea of where the crab fishery is fishing. So the footprint of the crab fishery will be um, really helpful to us in understanding the crossover between where whales are and where the crab fishery occurs. And this is where um, the, the um, benefit to our conservation plan and our risk reduction managers come, management comes into play is, is our ability to um, understand that co-occurrence uh, better. And what we've learned um, since I think 2009, since we've been collecting logbook data is we're getting some data from logbooks, but it's not, it's not very efficient. It's not at all efficient. And uh, we aren't, there's a lack of compliance, a lack of some really reliable data for us. And it is incredibly time consuming too, I think for you and for us. So um, you'll see through this presentation that um, this electronic monitoring can be an alternative to this paper logbook. So the EM pilot project um, allowed us to test different tools. We know Washington fishery management is unique because of our co-management responsibilities. Not only do we have some tri-state boundaries, but multiple SMA and UNA boundaries as well. Uh, we tested equipment that could be more effective than paper logbooks for collecting location data to help identify gear tampering and support whale conservation efforts. And so we learned from testing all this data that GPS location combined with hydraulic pressure readings can provide accurate spatial data. And that cellular data transmission allows us to have more accurate location data for a reasonable cost. Um, data transmitted via satellite, for example, VMS, would cost much more to attain the same level of accuracy that we can get from cellular transmitted data. And we found out that this type of data can potentially replace um, paper logbook location data. Um, we were able to develop a plan for the data flow between the vessel, um, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, and WDFW while maintaining the confidentiality of that data and giving us access to it as well. We learned that with electronic monitoring, um, we can easily verify reported fishing locations. We can enforce area closures and pot limits with the capability to identify individual pot call locations. And it provides another source of in information to identify gear tampering. It eliminates the need for fishermen to fill out logbooks for fishing location data. Hey Robert, do you want to take a minute to um, orient people to what, what we're showing on this slide? Yeah. So, with this, for those of you that, that can see this slide, we have in the black is the 
10 second track line data from a vessel and the green triangles are the hydraulic individual pothole locations and then the yellow line would be the vessel the reported vessel logbook information so you can see there's a little bit of difference between where the vessel logbook information was reported and where the hydraulic information shows that they were actively fishing and how this could be used to potentially identify gear tampering would be um, if this particular vessel were to go off and haul gear in a, a different location than they had ever been previously with their track line data that would show they're going somewhere where they had never been to set gear and yet started hauling gear so we feel like this could be used to help us identify gear tampering And so what, what, what about video? Um, the funding for the pilot project ended in 2022. Um, we were interested in exploring video and heard support from industry for a video-based system. Um, we continued, we wanted to continue the pilot project and install two video systems on, on two vessels with agency funding that were currently testing now in the 2022-2023 season and we'll continue to test but we conferred with PSMFC, WDFW enforcement and our IT staff and learned that um, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission does not at this time have the uh, capacity to store additional video data for us to store that data it would be relatively inexpensive but to access it to use it in any sort of capacity would be very expensive and that there's complex hardware and data ownership issues um, who would be the ownership of the data if the vessel the vessel purchases the equipment but yet the data is coming to WDFW and then there's unclear legal obligations and requirements to review the collected data. So how much data do we have to legally review? Is it 50%? Is it 10%? Um, those questions still need to be answered. And then the chain of command um, for the hardware that would be used and, and the data used for enforcement purposes. Someone would physically have to go to the vessel to um, switch out or remove those hard drives and then bring them to a WDFW facility and then that data would have to be downloaded and, and how that happens there's still questions to be answered and then the video obviously increases costs the video systems are three to five times more expensive than a regular cellular um, EM system with just location capabilities so so where does that leave us for now so because of those things that that Robert walked walked us through um, our proposed system that we'll take to the commission to be implemented for the upcoming season won't include video. Um, but we really are keeping the idea open and our minds open to the potential for video. So we'll continue the discussions that we've had around data storage, um, talking with IT. We'll also track changing technology that could really make video more feasible for us in the future. Um, so right now, while we're not pursuing video, we are just simply proposing a system that tracks location in combination with hydraulic pressure sensor reading uh, to track fishing activity. So vessels participating in the coastal dangerous crab fishery will um, the idea is they will have an EM system with a hydraulic pressure sensor capable of recording pressure every 10 seconds and placed to prevent tampering and the ability to produce a GPS data point at least once per minute while underway and at, a, at least once per minute every uh, once every 30 minutes while at the dock. The system must be able to transmit data cellularly in near real time and connected to a continuous power supply 24-7. Uh, a feedback mechanism must be able to provide the operator a way to determine the system is operational 
And WDFW plans on providing a list of devices, uh, vendor contact information, and, and the system requirements. So the regulatory approach that we have been thinking through um, here is to we'll capture this these specifications basically what Robert just walked through here's the minimum you'll need on your vessel in order to participate in the fishery that will be included in in regulation in rule language and then uh, to supplement that which will also be referred to in the rule language is a compliance guide um, so, and the compliance guide will give you a lot more information on um, installing and operating these systems and, and what you'll need to do. Um, so the rule will link this requirement to the license owner and through the license it will also um, be linked to the vessel that's designated on that license and to the operator and the alternated, alternate operator that are um, designated to that license. Um, so I, when we talk to Captain Chadwick about this too, we look at the compliance guide and maybe thinking about it as a, as a really important reference document that you'll all have um, at your fingertips to really help with the implementation. It'll just provide more details that, that won't be in the actual rule, but it'll um, help help with the understanding how to implement the rule effectively. We've also really been thinking about changing technology, you know, and, and um, things are evolving in our world really fast. I can't keep up. So if there are, if we learn of things that are more efficient for you or more efficient for us that we can incorporate into this rule. We've been thinking about how to do that. And I think there's ways that we can um, do that uh, through minimal additional rulemaking, but we also wanted to uh, give ourselves an opportunity to evaluate the electronic monitoring program after a period of some years. Um, so we would have a program review, and for those of you that um, have tracked Oregon's um, whale risk reduction measures, you know they had a three-year sunset, and I think they're reevaluating their rules this year. It doesn't mean that they're starting from scratch. If everything's going great, they can just roll, roll those rules over. But if there's changes that can be made, um, can we build in? A video at that time that we've gotten to the place where that's a good point to bring it in. We really want to think about it in terms of of building in our ability to adjust and change and um, make improvements to what we implemented. So you know this isn't a, a one and done here. We've kind of seen some evolution to electronic monitoring over time. So what does this EM compliance guide look like? Um, the compliance guide will provide details on how to install an EM device and, and vendor contact information. It'll have what components are needed to have a working electronic monitoring system. And then how to conduct a preseason test to determine that WDFW is receiving the vessel's data. How to perform quick pre-trip checks to determine the system is operating properly and what to look for during fishing and how to ensure the system is supplied power between trips. So we'll also need um, an EM affidavit will be necessary to link an EM device's unique ID to that crab fisher's license. Um, this will have to be done after fishers have installed an EM device on the vessel after the device has been installed and the affidavit um, is submitted, vessels, vessel operators will contact WDFW staff to confirm the system is operational. Um, since this is how we will link the EM data to your license, um, a new affidavit would have to be submitted anytime changes are made, such as vessel transfers um, or, or changes such as that to that information. If you require a new device because you choose to go with a new system or something like that, um, this would have to be resubmitted. 
And then what if the what if the system fails? So if during your pre-trip check the system is found to be non-operational, um, vessel operators should immediately contact their service provider to schedule a service call and WDFW staff um, for a waiver permit to continue fishing. So waiver permits will be issued for an EM system failure and will be valid for three days. Um, during this time, vessel operators must complete uh, an approved WDFW logbook and turn in a copy every day fishing activity occurs. Uh, WDFW enforcement will be able to issue waiver extensions for extenuating circumstances. But the idea is this will give you a chance to schedule service, get your system fixed, um, but still continue to fish. <clears throat> So what do these systems cost? Um, in general, the hardware for the initial install is looking between $500 to $1,000. And then we added with, with video there is more like $4,000 to $5,000. So some vendors offer bulk pricing and there is potential for crab associations or fishermen groups to coordinate large purchases. Um, some vendors have installation costs, but most have the option for fishermen to install the system themselves to defray that installation cost. And then all of these cellular systems um, have data plans that are needed for that cellular transmission. Um, those subscriptions range from $350 to $500 per year, or you can pay monthly, um, $50 to $70 per month, and some Vendors are off offering fishing season subscriptions, such as a six to nine month subscription for a, a prorated fee that would be cheaper than the monthly. Um, service calls are expected to be minimal, but cost for service will vary among vendors. And then some vendors have already stated they would hire um, technicians to service Washington ports and expect service call fees to be between $150, $200 per year. And so <clears throat> our experience with pilot project and outreach with other fisheries has shown several systems can meet our requirements. Um, the first one is the Archipelago Fish View Lime system that we've been testing on 12 vessels in our pilot project with satisfactory results. Um, that Unit cost is $975. ODFW is currently testing um, the Ferry of Need Century system, and we've talked with um, this company as well, and they think they can also meet our needs. So that unit cost would be $600. <clears throat> and then Quinault is using, um, currently using the Teamfish Snap IT AI Hub, which is much more costly due to the capability of accepting video. And so that unit cost is $5,000. And then another system that we know could meet our needs is Pacific Coast Fishery Services. They provide systems to 200 plus vessels in the Canada's Dungeons Crab Fisheries. And they confirmed that they have systems that would meet our needs, but has not provided any product information at this time. <coughs> And additional vendors may be able to provide um, compliant systems, especially as we uh, announce our specifications and they, they could um, add, you know, a big thing with ours is the hydraulic pressure sensor. Um, so as long as their system has an input available, they could probably gear up and, and provide a, a system as well. Someone, someone, on, uh, yeah. <laughs> someone on the phone needs to mute. We can hear your car door. Your, your, your car door alarm. I want to just pause here too before Lorna walks us through this slide and just say thanks for the comments in the chat. We'll finish our presentation and we'll go back and we have time for a discussion. That's what this is meant for. So we'll start answering the questions that are coming up in the chat um, so everyone can see them.
Uh, Lauren is having, it looks like Lauren is having technical difficulty. <laughs> you want me to walk through this, Lorna? Can you hear me? Well, yep, you sound good. At first. Are you able to hear me, Heather? Yeah, we can hear you, Lorna. Okay, I'll just go ahead. So uh, this slide is really just to, to show you where, where we are headed with the rule making. What, what is the rule making timeline and what does the process look like? So at the end of June, um, we'll file what's called our, our CR 102. That's the proposed rule. That's the rule that'll have um, these, these system specifications <coughs> in it. Um, and, and once you file the CR 102, that opens um, the door for public comment and you can provide public comment through, um, we have a new agency portal to do that. Um, but once we file the CR 102, once it's filed in the state register, you'll get a letter from us explaining what's in the rule and how to comment and all of that. So you don't have to remember that for now. What, what we also think about when we put this proposed rule out there is that also that signals to um, electronic monitoring vendors or companies that are, you know, looking at this and saying, okay, you know, here's 200 license holders that are going to need a system like this by December 1. And, um, you know, so we're hoping that gets them kind of understanding better what our what our system specifications are so that they can be responsive and we're thinking the more people that can provide this information the better the cost savings might be to um, folks that are license holders that will be required to buy it so then our first um, commission meeting is august 10th um, through 12th i'm not sure what date that will be um, at the commission meeting, we'll walk through the Fish and Wildlife Commission through all of this, and um, and it, it gives them an opportunity to understand the rules we're proposing, but it's also another opportunity for public comment. Um, and uh, so that's a good place for stakeholder meetings. When, when we've talked about electronic monitoring, we absolutely recognize it's it's a big deal and it's a, a change to how we've done business and it will cost license holders money, license holder money, yeah. Um, so it's really a big reason why we held these three industry meetings last summer and fall. Want to be very open and transparent with what we're thinking, give you all opportunity to provide us feedback. We've got 12 vessels, um, you know, running these systems right now and have been since 2021, at least some of them in 2021, um, and hear from you. So we, we don't want to go to the commission with being sideways with everyone. And and again, so that's, that's number one for the pilot project. Is this the right system for Washington's needs, which are probably very different than Oregon and California? Um, and have fishermen actually had these on their boats and said, yeah, you know, this this is working and and this is a tool that that I can use and if it replaces logbooks, that's great. So that'll happen in um, August. And then in September is when the commission takes their final action. So they make a decision on these rule proposals. They'll consider the public comment that has been provided and the input from um, staff like us and and make a final decision. Um, so that will be uh, September 28th to the 30th. Again, I'm not sure, certain about the date, but if the commission um, approves the rule proposals, then um, the rule would actually be in effect 31 days after that. And then that'll um, get everyone situated to have this, this um, 
in place by the start of the upcoming season. We've got December 1, uh, 2024 on there, 2020, but it should be December 1, 2023. Um, so this December, and um, so if there's any questions about the rulemaking, Lorna can help with that. Um, also wanted to talk about, you know, again, our recognition that, that this is not only a significant change, it's something that we've heard um, I think will be beneficial to our industry, but getting the, the system in place and on vessels by December 1, 2023 will take some work. And so once the, even though the rule isn't effective for 31 days after the um, commission takes action, there's still a month of opportunity, I think, for us and for you all to start uh, working on the installation process and selecting vendors uh, that you want to have for your EM that you are certain will meet the requirements um, that we've outlined in our rule. So our vision is uh, from October to November, that kind of work will be done, installation will be, be um, happening. Um, you'll submit your affidavit to WDFW um, and then get your system up and running and verify that data is transmitting. Um, prior to that, of course, again, we'll send out um, a letter with, with the uh, information from the commission's action in September. Uh, that, and that letter will um, give you more information on the compliance guide and other little details. I, I, I'm I'm certain that there will be questions and we'll, we'll be there to help with this process. And um, that's why it's got license holders and WDFW up there. So to get this all in place, um, we'll have a system outline for you, um, but we'll be there working on it as well. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And so I just wanted to um, go back to this, the final slide here on this before we start our discussion and summarize, you know, what, what are these requirements again? So by December 1, 2023, well, each license holder will, that is going to participate in the fishery will need a electronic monitoring system that has a hydraulic pressure sensor that transmits a, uh, a hydraulic pressure sensor reading every 10 seconds. It must be installed in a way that avoids um, tampering. And, and then it also must um, transmit uh, GPS location. That would be only on a, every one minute when a vessel's on the water. When the vessel's at the dock, it only needs to transmit once every 30 minutes. Um, the transmission needs to be done by a cellular uh, transmission. There needs to be a continuous power supply to the system 24 seven, and it needs to have something on the system that shows you whether or not the system is operating. You need to be able to know if it's operating or not. So even if that's a, a little red light or something like that, you need to know when it's operating and when it's not operating. Um, so again, we, you know, this is a little bit more specific than we've had for you before. Um, we really hope that having this information helps industry prepare for implementation. You know, we can't go out and advocate for any certain vendor or product. And we hope that uh, even if through these websites, we can somehow introduce the crab industry to the EM industry and um, help with some relationship developing there and thinking that, you know, EM providers would be smart to be reaching out to industry associations and that kind of a thing to maybe come to your meetings or, or something like that to say, this, this is what I'm going to need who can provide it, who can assure me that they can provide it in, in the way that I need it to so I can be compliant with these rules. Um, and again, we have uh, really wanted to have this conversation early and often with you all again. So appreciate those uh, of you that have been engaged in this process as we've gone through it. So 
Um, we can go back to the questions in the chat, but I think I'll just maybe start with folks. Um, if there's any hands up right now, I know we've had a lot of people join us since we started. Um, so just pause for hands up or. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So uh, I've got a number of questions, um, and I'm not sure, you know, how we would go through them. I'm sure others have multiple questions, or many have questions. I would expect. Um, from the get go, uh, when uh, there was a request for support to get the grant funding for the pilot program, um, I expressed uh, a concern about, especially when there would be an equipment failure or for some reason unintentional to the operator, license holder, uh, whoever, that uh, that equipment was not functional uh, for different reasons um, and that that could really leave a huge impact on someone if they weren't allowed to go fishing. Uh, well, whatever technical difficulty there is uh, would be in place. So that continues to be something I'm, I'm real concerned about. I do see you have, you know, some some provision for that, but I, I am concerned that a three days on the on the get go at the beginning of a brand new program that has this much change to what people do is is a bit sh is short. Um, so that's a comment, not a question. Um, but one another place that I'm concerned and and I'll I like I say I have about eight questions and I won't go through each of them right now, um, but I'd like to come back to them. But I am concerned, especially about the availability of the equipment in order to meet the timeline that's expected. Um, and, and as I see it, even though you've said, well, you've got October to go get your equipment, that will be in the absence of knowing the rule is in place. So we're counting a month, apparently, from WDSW's perspective, that is a month that would be considered time for a person to install equipment that we don't know for sure is gonna be required by the commission. And so if we uh, were to look at it from when the commission will take its action, there's only gonna be one month to acquire, install, test, and get an affidavit for this equipment before potentially a season could open in a portion of Washington. And I, I just find that uh, really a kind of a tough situation potentially. Uh, so we get back to what is what is the availability of this equipment and how likely is it to get uh, uh, vessels done in a month after the rule may or may not be approved. Uh, so that, I'll, that's a couple I'll start with the Okay, okay. And no problem on having eight questions. I appreciate it. That's what this day is for. So no problem on that, Larry. And thanks for getting us kicked off. I have a couple things, but I, I'm sure Robert does too. Uh, one on the waiver. It's a three-day waiver, but there will be, if, if, that, if that doesn't work, if you need to um, extend your waiver, you know, we are envisioning it happening like that. You'll reach out to enforcement or us, um, the EM program folks, and say, this is the reason why I can't. But the three days, you know, gets the vendor on notice. you got to get here. and But we're absolutely, we'll work with people if you need an extension of that waiver. Um, and then on the, the commission takes action. They make their decision. They're, they're not going to rescind their decision after that on September. So you, you can, that's, that's not a month lost there um, where you have to just sit and do nothing because something might change. They, I don't see things changing after the commission decision in September. So that's where 
we do see October as a viable um, time for this installation to start happening. Um, and then Robert, I know, has done a lot of talking to folks about the availability of, of these products. Yeah, so as far as supply, um, I know Archipelago has enough units on hand right now where they could outfit the whole fleet if necessary. Um, the other Fairy Bead Century units, they also have probably enough units on hand right now to outfit our whole fleet. Um, they are one of the ones that are outfitting some of those East Coast lobster vessels, so there might be a, a little bit of competition there um, with our fleet around that same timeline. Um, but they, they that should be fine. And then there's also there's like I said, there's other vendors that are available that that could come out with a system for even lower cost point once we announce rules. But there's definitely the the availability is there. Um, and then a couple vendors have already expressed if we are going to have. Um, if they are going to have that big of a footprint in our fleet, they would want technicians in port to be able to service this stuff, and they would hire staff. Archipelago has two technicians now in Astoria um, that already service are servicing our pilot program. And if they were to be a, a vendor that had more of our vessels, they would. They've already said they would probably put a technician in Westport as well. The technician is. Uh... Difficult one sometimes. I mean, you said you had two in Astoria, but you know, we used to have three in Iwanko. We don't have any now. And so I don't know what kind of a bottleneck that would end up potentially being. Yeah, and that's where, you know, that's where the EM waiver being able to be flexible there would come in. You know, we don't we don't know what kind of timeline the service is going to be yet. If I, I if I may. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Larry. So one thing we can clarify right away is uh, I don't have that uh, slide in front of me, but you are saying that the commission will announce its decision on September uh, 30th. Is that what you're saying? And then number two, I still think that in the first year for this really radical, in my mind, change to our fishery, uh, and uh, some fairly cumbersome steps, it seems, for most to get through, that we ought to start out on the initial season with more than three days on that automatic waiver. I really believe that is an important thing to do. The anxiety level for the fleet is pretty damn high regardless of the new need. And then you'll add this need and then somebody gets jammed up and they don't either get the equipment or they have the equipment installed and it's not working. Uh, you know, just adding that, okay, in three days, this has got to be resolved or now I'm, you know, you're just, and I'm saying for the first year, I'm not saying that long term, three days is not an adequate initial waiver period. But I really think for the first year, it ought to be something longer out the get go if there's to compensate for some of this new changes. And then I'll get back to the other questions after other people have a chance to ask questions. Okay. Yeah, okay. And and thanks. I mean we spent quite a bit of time talking about this yesterday and the idea we, we recognize that anxiety, that concern is real. You know, we've we've also implemented quite a few Kind of big things in Washington. We are the first ever to have a pot limit. We've we've done a lot of maybe radical things for our fishery, but I think we've also done it in a way, at least from my point of view, uh, where our enforcement officers is, have used really fair discretion, and people haven't been, you know, no one's taken a hardcore attitude toward this. That people recognize. It, it's going to be, there's going to be some lumps and bumps along the way. I'm not saying that we're not open to thinking about a different waiver period, but I'm just saying also recognize that I think we haven't been um, tackled these kind of things with a real uh, heavy hand, at least from, from my viewpoint anyway. So 
I got one question on the cellular transmission. Mm -hmm. Which companies have you tested and are all of this? Uh, is the cellular transmission really available from all companies on the ocean? Let's say somebody's fishing out towards 100 fathoms. That could be 30 miles offshore. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so what part of what they'll do, these systems will do, is they'll hold that data until they're back in cell range. So yeah, when you go far offshore, there, there are some dead zones and there are dead spots. Most of these systems bounce off all cell carrier carriers, so they're not limited to Verizon or at and or something like that. But they store the data for up to um, 30 days on the system, and then when they come back in to cell range, that would start transmitting. Okay. Yeah, we didn't really cover that. I realized oh, that the, um, one of the requirements will be, we didn't put that in here, the system will need to have that storage. So yeah, the one one minute and 10 second transmission rates are when you're in cell, and but then to have the ability when you're out of cell range to store it until you're back and then transmit it. That's pretty key for, for the coast. Oh, yeah. Because cell just doesn't equal every place. Yeah, no. and so Robert, on Dale's question about the providers, if we just used a variety of providers, does that even matter? For? The pilot project, the folks that are running it now? Or what? What cell service they're using now? Yeah, so we, we've used, um, they, they bounce off whatever towers are there. Okay. Currently, the system we're using with Lime is actually using at and which hasn't been very reliable for cell service on our coast, but we're still getting complete data from that, even though we might be missing it in real time for a couple hours, and then it all uploads after a couple hours. So, but their, their actual SIM card in the system is an at and SIM card. So I see Ben has a comment. Uh, yes, it's kind of, uh, piggybacking off what Larry said um, on the three-day waivers is part of, the, part of the process or part of the reasoning for the electronic monitoring is to eliminate the gear tampering and, and theft that happens out there. Uh, is is there any way to possibly for you know fishing games to, to get some self-contained units that could be put on vessels? Because I I know how thieves think, and if they can get a three-day waiver by claiming that their machine doesn't work, they're going to go out there and rob our gear for three more days. But if we get some self-contained units that could be, you know, like plug and play on a vessel, that could eliminate a lot of that. I mean, I, I really am hoping for the, you know, in, in the in the future, some uh, video video monitoring of the of the hauling stations, kind of like you do on the East Coast, that cut down their their theft over there by you know, like ninety some percent from that last thing I read. And out here, it's a it's a horrible horrible problem. I, mean, I know I know Captain Chadwick, and I've talked to him, and I've talked to. Uh, uh, Brian Alexander down here in Westport, and without video evidence, there's really not much they can do. I mean, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the early 90s, we didn't have this problem because, well, fishing, fishing problems, we had our way of handling them. But nowadays, we don't. And, uh, and there's a lot of those little guys, you know, Larry and myself included, that we just get robbed blind every year, uh, and we struggle. Um, give somebody a waiver. A thief is going to see a three-day waiver as three days of robbing people's gear. And uh, that that's to get to I think to get the small guys or to get the fish to buy back in this or or buy in anyway is we have to have a little bit more, a little more proof in the and the and the, the pasta. Uh, so I think that's what's happening for now. I'll have more questions later. I promise. <laughs> yeah. So so Ben, with that, you know, we we talked with Captain Chadwick about this and. And he really believes this will be a useful tool for, for identifying that gear tampering and just using it as part of the, the, the whole package to identify this, um, these problems. And, you know, we, we know that this can be used and it has been used to identify um, already in the pilot um, program and, and whatnot to identify some um, closed area violations, some fair start violations. And, and and some some other violations along that lines, and we will be able to identify that gear tampering, and then enforcement can use that information to build a case. Robert, you want to go back to the slide um, if folks can see this visually. 
So we we also when we kind of <laughs> with the lines. Yeah. So um, as we've been exploring video and realized, you know, it was just it's just something we can't implement right now. Looking at what we're going to get from this EM system, it's going to be very clear if someone goes and, and is fishing outside of where they have set their strength. So the EM program folks that are looking at this data will see, okay, this is your vessel's track line. This is where you have your gear set. And all of a sudden on this day, this gear's over here. It's got the hydraulic thing running. And I realize some, you're saying, if your system is not working, um, that won't that won't be effective. But we'll be able to, I think, see the the vessel put some pieces together to help at least inform enforcement's ability to um, prosecute the scare tampering. Yeah, and, and with the, the the system not working and having a waiver, you know these systems are pretty reliable. We've we've had these systems on twelve vessels and only had one issue, and that was a, a GPS um, issue. So the system was actually still working. We're still getting hydraulic data, um, and there's two parts to it, right? There's the hydraulic and there's the GPS. So if they disable and try and uh, do a workaround or circumvent the hydraulics, we'll still have the GPS data. To back that up, if they try and disable the whole whole system, um, obviously they're going to have to have a service technician come out, and those service technicians are going to know, like, okay, is this is this something that is probably uh, um, tampering, or is it a normal problem that we see with these systems? So I think enforcement will have the discretion there um, to figure out is this waiver justified or or, or not. Does that answer your question, Ben? I see you got your hand up again. Or not? I know he's cutting out a little bit, so um, I don't know. maybe we'll we'll go to Greg McMillan, and then if uh, Ben has a follow up, we can go back to that. Okay. And Heather, there were some questions in the chat earlier, and I noted those. Um, yeah. And we can oh, maybe circle back to those as well. Yeah. Thank you, Lorna. Can I have a oh. comment on this too, so we have a chance? Okay. Go ahead, Greg. Hello. Hey, it's Greg. Um, yeah, my, my question is, is right now I feel um, I have two separate systems on my boat. I've got one of the electronic monitoring and then we're doing the electronic log book with deck and throw. And I'm just, I mean, are, are, is this whole conversation about the electronic, the, the, the part and not the electronic log book or, or I guess I'm confused. Yes, I feel like we have two, two different, two totally yeah, different so things. Greg, we, we, because yeah, I think so we were the electronic out monitor the it's pretty easy. I mean, we don't do anything with that. It's just basically having to be an boat with the hydraulic sensor. And and I think that uh, as far as that, I mean, there's no anxiety there. It works. I mean, I haven't had a problem that I know of. Um, but you know, is it is is it and is this going to replace the electronic logbook or the the logbook in general? Because obviously, you know, uh, being being in the port we were in, I think our records keeper there at the cannery got in a little little trouble this year was not writing the correct times because obviously you guys know when we come in and when we unload. And I think there was just a couple hour differences or whatever between the trip ticket and not. So they're obviously very accurate. And that's what I was trying to figure out. Is this going to replace what we're trying to do because the electronic logbook this year was um difficult at best i mean we had it's been i think that deck and pro was i think it could be a good system but yeah i think it was rushed through and 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 i know a few guys in our area that were having a little bit of difficulty with it. but um is is that is, is the plan to, just to replace that with this electronic monitoring 
Yeah. Yeah, Greg, th that is the plan. The, the data that we'll get just from the EM, just the GPS and the hydraulic pressure sensor is enough to replace what we're getting from the logbook. And I think um, the only time you'll need to fill a logbook out is if you're operating under a waiver and you would have the option of doing a paper logbook or an electronic logbook. And I think Robert heard from these folks that are developing this e-log, put it out there for you guys as an option. Do you want to try this? And so it, it was really only just to explore the idea, but it isn't something that we were thinking would accompany the electronic monitoring requirements that we're making. Okay, because that was, that was a question of some of the guys in our port. Uh, okay. It was a little confusing. Uh, you know, we felt like we were doing two different things, and it was yeah. uh, that's that's uh, clarifying there that the board can tell them. And and another thing is honestly is is I do agree with Larry. I mean, I think this first year we've got to figure out. You know, until every everything gets implemented, the three days is kind of you know that could be that. I, I know you said you could and all that, but that could be very costly at the beginning of the season for a lot of guys and things go haywire. But that being said, I feel like Monic has been solved. It's tricky. It, it works pretty flawlessly, I thought. But, uh, I haven't gotten any nasty phone calls. <laughs> but, um, but another thing is, I you know, we fish in a very congested area. You know, there's a lot of gear where I'm at. And I, I mean, quite frankly, I don't see where that, this thing right here is going to, you know, uh, uh, resolve any kind of gear tampering where we fish, where I'm fishing at. Because I, I, I'll be honest, I can look out my window and see my next string and there's three strings in between it. So mm -hmm. that's somebody else's gear. So it's going to be, you know, that's going to be a hard one to say, oh, you must have been under somebody else's gear because, I mean, we're, we're, it's just a big pile up where we fish. So it might work further offshore, might work further north, might work in areas like that. But I don't see where, you know, unless a guy takes off and runs 10 miles up the hill away from his gear. That, but uh, anyway, that's my thought on that. So, okay. Okay. Well, I have a comment here. You're saying this could replace logbooks, but I'm not seeing any input for catch data, which is a critical piece of what's going on. You can't look that at that chart. Trip tickets? Don't we get that data from trip tickets? Yeah. 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 So it. the way that will work, and that's um, Robert mentioned it, but just so each each uh, system will have its own individual uh, system number and your license number, and that will link to your fish tickets. But that sets us up for exactly the same problem we just had last year with catch reporting and tribal sharing, and people have gear on one area, and people have more of some of their same gear in a different area, and deciding how much pounding goes into which area. We just took it in the shorts last year on catch sharing for that exact scenario. That yeah. sounds like you're setting it up for it again. Well, this will help identify that by by being able to see where the majority of your gear is we can look at what your fish ticket says and it's that already that doesn't tell you where the majority of my catch was yeah. it, exactly but it gives you a, a proxy an idea right because we can't tell cpue but we can tell if something's funky and this is already this past year averted one of those situations we had another situation where we had about 10 landings that were reported in the wrong area but because we had one of the vessels that were making those landings was on EM, we were able to see, you know, he didn't fish in that area. That that catch area is wrong. And we're able to call the buyer and say, hey, we noticed you got some funky tickets. There's about 10 here. We know one is not true because we have the EM data. So it doesn't, with the percentages, you're right. We can't say their CPUE could be different from here to here. We have an idea. But what we can see is, did you fish in that area or not? And, and that's exactly what happened in this situation was they reported fishing in that area, 
but our data showed no, you weren't in that area at all. We called the fisherman. <laughs> were you were you in that area that you reported on your fishing? He said no, there must be a mistake at the fishery. We were able to correct it before we shared that data with the tribes and prevented. There's. That's this situation like nothing that. is going to change the fact that it's your responsibility to accurately report where your catch comes from on your fish ticket. This isn't going to artificially, you know, or not artificially, but automatically um, put that on the fish ticket. You will still have that control to say, okay, yeah, I fish over the line at 68.1 and 68.2, but I catch majority of my crab here and less here. That's Still, yeah, what you're it's putting it's on the Essentially, when I did this this season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 80% yeah, was on A1 and 20% was on A2. Yeah, you'll and still, you'll have, still that. have that. Okay. Yeah. And we'll be able to verify some of that with this, though. Okay. And then Especially the other, those mistakes. Like and then the other comment I have you're talking when I'm laying gear, you don't know where I lay gear until I circle back and run that gear. Mm -hmm. If I got 30 pots sitting on the back deck, those pots could be anywhere on that black line. You right. don't know until I run them. Right, but if you never went there before, so never been there's there. a guy over oh, here right. next to you that... But my, like the, the person was just saying, so much of the river fishing is in a big crowd, and so if you have all my track lines, it's going to look like a spider web. Yeah. So you don't really know if I circle back and running my gear or running the guy's stream that's right there. True. And especially if I haven't ran that string yet, or mm -hmm. you don't know. I saw um, Larry's hand go up and then Ben's hand go up. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. So uh, I did want to just uh, a little clarity on the anxiety issue. Uh, as we all know, this, you know, the fishing is a high anxiety business to begin with, but I was speaking more in terms of uh, uh, of the anxiety that would be coupled with not having the equipment in place for the beginning of the season or not functionally operating at the beginning of the season. Uh, and then that waiver necessity in order to make sure we don't cost that person uh, days fished. Um, and again, the uh, special anxiety, because this is new, the technology has been proven by those who are on the phone or on this meeting today and by other conversations I've had with those who have used it. So the technology itself seems to be uh, pretty uh, operational uh, and fairly uh, problem free. It's I'm just concerned about here getting everything secured, getting everybody ready to go, and what the potential harm could be to them if they don't, for good reason, get it done. Uh, the other question, so that's just a little clarity on the anxiety piece. Um, so who, first, who is responsible for compliance? Is it the vessel license owner? Is it a potential alternate operator? Is it a potential vessel owner if they're different? Um, that's a question. And then what are the potential impacts of non-compliance? You know, you mentioned uh, the idea of enforcement uh, discretion, which I really appreciate should be a fundamental piece of enforcement. But I, I frankly, without uh, overstating it, I've been a little less uh, comforted by uh, uh, by what may not be a lot of discretion applied, uh, and I'm not challenging anybody here. I'm just saying it's kind of feels a little different uh, when we've had these uh, closures and timelines and whether to get it done, where where we've had uh, you know the tag issue and people bringing in untagged gear, stuff such like that. I'm just not as comfortable with the discretionary piece of enforcement as I think we should be or could be. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Um, so anyway, those were a couple of questions. Who's responsible for compliance and what's going to be the cost of non-compliance? Is it going to be you can't go fishing? Is it going to be a... F yeah, I mean, at least in the first year, um, 
the cost of non-compliance will be in the form of a fine, right? So just like any other ticket, you would be fined. Um, we, we don't have a, a three strikes and you're out type of thing, but I do envision down the road and not for not for um, this upcoming season, but down the road, uh, just once we get through this first year of working it all through, it would be a requirement to renew your license to show that you have a that um, EM affidavit um, and, and your individual number to be able to report that on your license renewal form in order to get your license. So um, that's how we're thinking about that. Um, the impacts of non-compliance that that wouldn't be in place for this year. So just just to clarify um, before someone else asks another question. So if 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 a guy was sitting at the dock for whatever good reason, his, his system was not in place or operational and he were to go out fishing, uh, he tried for the waiver. Uh, maybe within those three days, the problem can't be resolved. Maybe for some hitch and, you know, just communications, the time isn't there to get that next waiver and he goes fishing. I mean, he's not going to be held at the dock at least this first year for not having that in place. Is that what I'm understanding? And then again, who is responsible? Who's responsible? Is it the owner of the vessel, owner of the license, operator of the vessel? Yeah, so you're thinking about that, right? No, we're not envisioning somebody being tied to the dock, um, especially in the first year. Um, and then the way it works, like with the pot limit, it's the license owner. So the license owner is the person that um, is responsible for making sure that's on the vessel that's designated to that his license. So that'll have to be, you know, the the vessel owner is going to want to be the one installing the system on their vessel um, if they're two different people. So um, it'll they'll have to be however that relationship works. But the license owner is ultimately responsible. We actually have the AG's office looking at our rules, and that is one of the questions that we have. So we can provide more clarity on that, but. The, the vessel is designated to a license. The, um, the license lists the primary and the alternate operator. And so they're all tied to that license. And that's really how we're thinking about, about that. Um, so I'm not sure like who the ticket would go to, um, but I imagine like if a, there's a pot limit violation, that pot limit is tied to the license, even though the vessel designated at might be operated by somebody different. I'm, I'm thinking it would be no different than how it works under the other rules that we have in place. But again, we can provide some more clarity on that when we, um, we're we meeting with the AG's office again next week. Now, I've got a question on that one. Yeah. <laughs> because I haven't been on the ocean for over 10 years. How can I be responsible for what happens on the ocean with someone else? Even I don't even know them both. You know? But I still have an interest in the permit. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a few. I don't know how many people are leasing permits in this state, but I assume it's quite a number. It's something we, we it's, you've asked that before, and it's something, you know, because leases are, it, it's a private agreement between the license owner and whoever they're leasing it to. We don't really get any information on it, so I don't know how many people. I have heard from you all that there's a lot more people that lease licenses compared to when I was managing the data and knew that mostly the license owners were the vessel operators in a lot of cases. So I don't know about that, but I mean, it's the it's still the license owner's responsibility to make sure that vessel is complying. Whether or not the, the vessel- Four o'clock in the morning, you gotta know if they're complying or not. <laughs> well, yeah, it wouldn't be every day. You would want to make sure they get the, the system that's reliable and meets the standards. And then um, from there, 
Yeah. So I've had a discussion with this with Dan, and I think okay. he's hopped off here now. I think um, it's on there. I believe anyone that's on the license could receive the ticket. So if okay. you have a vessel that you designate, but the operator is not you, the operator of the vessel would be on your license as well. They would be able to receive the ticket, and that's where enforcement would have discretion. Is this a failure on your part as a license owner, or is it a failure on the vessel operator, your designated operator? Thanks. And then anyone on the license could receive that ticket. And to that point, I think it's important to send out those requirement packets to everybody, at least the primary operators, in addition to the permit holder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those would go out too. Because yeah. if the guy running the boat doesn't have requirements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, we have at times with these important rules done, not only primary, but also alternate operator. Yeah. So, yeah, that's. Well yeah, I got a, another follow-up question on that. Okay. If you have operators on your thing, and if you start getting too many, instead of jerking the guy's owner's license, put it against the operator's license. If he's scratched off that license, he can't go fishing. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. At least you uh, minimize the damage to the owner. Mm -hmm. Okay. You might not give his payment for the year or give his lease payment, but uh, that's a little not quite as severe as losing a permit or something. Right. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Is this waiver just going to three day waiver? Is it going to be like a Call in, voicemail, email. What yeah. physically is going to be happening there? Yeah, good question. We've been we've been thinking about that too. What does this look like? And we we have we need to refine it a little bit. But what we're thinking, Larry, is um, you could send an email, and there'll be a specific email address for a waiver request. That's all you would send that to. The the waiver would come to us. That email will come to us or a group of us. And then we could reply back with some kind of an electronic waiver. So you want to have it on your phone or your computer, that kind of thing. But in all, like in some ways, an automatic reply. So there's not this. I'm gonna run to Montezuma and I'll get this piece of paper. Right. That we're thinking differently than that, and how we can automate it in a way that we have, you know, effective control over it. But um, right, because I see somebody showing up at the boat at four o'clock in the morning. The system's not working. Yeah. Hey, it's the time we're going. Yeah. I don't want to be waiting for somebody to answer a phone or email somewhere. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how soon do they get back? <laughs> yeah, and and this will happen on a Saturday, inevitably, <laughs> or exactly. a Sunday. Exactly. Five fifteen on Friday. Christmas morning, <laughs> Friday. <laughs> so yeah, we're we're thinking through that that one too. Okay. Uh, but but something like that automated, so you can. Um, Right, we don't want to see people back to the dock, especially, yeah, well, ever, but. Um, another thing I didn't touch on in this rulemaking and the, because there's a lot of details, uh, is this idea of getting back together with you all again, like before the commission's final action. So sometime before that September, Commission meeting potentially August or or so, and um, have another opportunity to follow up on the commission discussion or talk about this again. Um, so we we want to make ourselves available to kind of update you on those kinds of questions. What does this look like? Really, how does it work? What what is what are some more information that's going to be in this compliance guide and that sort of thing? So we're looking around that time frame to have another one of these type of meetings uh, to fill in any blanks or answer questions. Um, let's take a question, this question from Ben, and then we can go and look at the uh, comments that were put in the chat, and we can walk through those. Okay, can you hear me this time? Yeah, you sound okay, Ben. Okay, um, I'm just kind of uh, backing up what uh, the gentleman at the table said that you know he, he hasn't been on the water for 10 years, but he leases his permit out. 
is if they are not in, if there's not some kind of language in the in the final ruling uh, on you know indemnifying them from any violations, it's going to it's going to raise the cost of leasing a permit through the roof because you know if you're asking somebody to take on liability for someone they don't know sometimes some somebody they don't have you know daily eyes on, uh, their their risk becomes you know the risk versus reward kind of deal. So mm-hmm. I would like to see some type of language in there that indemnifies the permit owner uh, from violations that are done by the the fisher if, if it's a lease permit. Uh, just to kind of, kind of, kind of, to that way they're not they're not having to take on any liability that they're not involved in in, in the day to day activities. Um, I'm I'm a lease permitter. I, I I lease my permit. I don't I don't own one, so I, I, mm-hmm. I keep buying scratch tickets, but I haven't got got one good yet. But uh, <laughs> but, but but to to have some some type of language in there that that gives them. Uh, not immunity, but you know, indemnifies them from any kind of uh, any kind of uh, violation. I think would be a good thing. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Ben. I have to think about that and understand that better. Again, that lease process is different. When we were talking to Dale about that, what I what I was thinking in my mind is, would this, you know, change your your lease contracts and how would you write that into your contract was kind of another way I was thinking, I think along the lines of what you're saying there, Ben, uh, just again, because we are not, we're not associated with those lease agreements in any way. Um, so it's very difficult for us to to navigate that, but I appreciate the, the thought. Um, okay, getting back to here. So let's see, let's go, th- I'll go through the chat comments here. Um, and we may have answered some of them along the way, uh, but we'll just um, go through them. I can get my mouse to move. Yeah, Heather, I think the only one that's remaining are the questions about um, video and if we've tested it. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I'll give that to Robert. Yeah, so we're currently testing a video system. Um, Archipelago's fish view vantage on two of our vessels. And so far, the it's good, um, but obviously it has, we still have the same questions that we had in our, our video um, question slide. Um, the one we're testing is about a $4,500 system. Um, it looks great. You can totally see the buoys as they're coming on board. We haven't had any issues with it, um, but uh, it is. We have to physically go down to the vessel to recover the hard drives, um, and so that that causes. That's where we have the issue. Is is that video storage? Okay. Thanks, Robert. Uh, two hands went up. Larry, then uh, Greg. Yeah, thanks, Editor. Um, so this is this question you can answer pretty easily, and maybe it's already been answered, but I'll ask it. And then I have a more significant question after that. So relative to the cell service, um, it's my understanding that there are times or places on our coast where cell service is is less efficient than others and it can be interrupted so if the cell service is interrupted for a period of time is that data that data then is still captured in the system and then transmitted later so that's a question you can answer that pretty simply the the more difficult question is I do believe there's quite a few open questions on the liability, uh, who is liable, uh, what is the consequence of uh, potential liability and the the non-compliance. However, I appreciated what I thought I was hearing is there would be, at least in the first year, uh, a tempering or the potential to be less severe if there's a non-compliance issue than there might be after this has become proven and and is in place. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, that kind of begs the question, and I know you won't be happy with me asking it, but 
But what is the downside to an additional season without implementation <clears throat> of the electronic monitoring? Um, how much is that downside uh, relative to the, some of the outstanding issues that seems to me are going to have to be resolved in a pretty short period of time? Um, uh, is, is, is it possible that there might be some benefit or significant benefit to clarifying some of these questions before uh, initiating or implementing impl implementing this for next year's season? That's 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 my that's my question, and uh, you know I, I I know relative to the incidental take permit, I don't believe National Marine Fisheries Service necessarily has uh, electronic monitoring. Uh, uh, high or uh, as indicated that that is a requirement to get an incidental take permit. Uh, I'm not sure that if we were to have uh, electronic monitoring in place, it will make much difference in our tribal negotiations for this next season. Hey. That's an assumption that might be beyond the pale. Uh, but I just I wanted oh, uh, to pose to I, pose the question. Boy, I don't know. Um, what, what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, no, I anticipated somebody would ask that question, Larry, for sure. And I, I don't think any of these questions are are things that we can't resolve here in in the near term. I, I do believe they're they're resolvable and they're not major hurdles to implementation for this year. I think yeah, I, and I also agree with you that the link to the conservation plan isn't a strong one in terms of moving forward. The biggest link is to our co-management uh, with Quinault without electronic monitoring. I, it's a mistake in my mind to, to um, slow this process down. Um, I, I think it would be a huge mistake, especially if if we can implement it. And I do believe that the way we've laid it out with this, the component and the specifications as they are is doable by December 1. We've been working on this since 2020, piloting it, testing it. It's not like we're running into any huge barriers with these systems not functioning. Um, so I think it would be a big mistake in our, to add, oh, well, we're just, we're not going to do this for um, until 2024. It's just will will not go over well. It's I think it's really valuable to all of you too. I think just uh, having the system implemented will benefit you all too. Outside of the co-management, I think it's a good step forward. And um, I yeah, again, I don't see anything any of these issues that are insurmountable between now and the rulemaking process. Well, I appreciate your answer. Uh, go ahead, Hillary, Sorry. but let me let me just, just, just say I'm, I'm not saying, well, let's just delay it for the sake of delaying it. I'm not saying that I'm saying there's some issues that are unresolved. If they get resolved, that makes a difference. But you know how how adequately will we get them resolved? And I appreciate your sense of confidence that they will be, but I'm not completely sure that that will be the case. I'll stop. I would, I would like to go very concerned. But in addition, we're hearing from a lot of fishermen and on the call today that I mean, I know you said it's going to be really valuable for us, but you were hearing people say that it's not going to be enough for, you know, to combat thievery, that it's, it's not going to be as valuable as it is. I don't know. It's really, you're coming in kind of low, so we're trying to turn up the volume. It's not on that one. Yeah, I don't, there's a lot of background noise. I don't know if somebody's not muted, but. But anyway, you're hearing from a lot of people who are saying it's not going to be valuable, you know, against theft, theft and, you know, when gear is so close together. I mean, you're hearing from a lot of people that it's not quite as valuable as you're, you know, it's being portrayed at the moment in the current, um, what's currently proposed. It's going to be expensive. I mean, there's a lot of, I know we need it for certain uh, aspects, but you're, you're hearing a lot of concerns about it as well. I'm hearing a lot of questions. Uh, I'll give you that. Um, 
I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, if people are saying uh, there's no value to this. I'm, I'm not hearing a lot of people saying, oh, this, this won't work and this isn't, uh, this isn't gonna be effective. So I just. I'll say it. This won't work and this isn't gonna be effective. Because you need video. You have to have video. Without the video component, it's, it's useless. Because all somebody has to do if they want to run your string is they just drive it the day before. Then they've been there. Then they go back and they fish it. Or if they want to sample your gear. I lose more money to guys sampling my pots than I do to guys running my gear. I had a spot this year where there was nobody within miles. I laid a 25 potter. I went back and fished it. There were people all over the place. There was nobody there before, and it was really good. But it was three to the pot first time I fished it, 20 to the pot second time I fished it. So people's sampling costs more money than people running your gear by far. Because some of my best strings this year, there's no way the guy that I won't name the boat, but there's no way he knew that that was the best string and he should lay me down a hundred feet on either side of my very best string on the ocean unless he was driving around sampling three days before i had three pots sampled the triggers were locked i knew they sampled it but all they would have to do is sample a pot that was on a previous track line and without a camera component it's worthless and as far as enforcing pot limits goes that just doesn't work either because guys move gear a lot. Mm -hmm. And if you, a lot of times I'll drive an area and I'll look at the bottom and then I'll be like, okay, then I'll go back and I'll dump gear there. So you're picking up pots and moving pots all the time. So it's impossible for you to know how many pots guys are fishing from the data. And then the, the elimination of logbooks thing doesn't work either because I was uh, in one area and I was getting one and a half to the pot. I was in another area, I was getting 17. So there, there can be a pretty big discrepancy, especially when you look around. So I just, for me, it's just big expense, hassle, headache. With the camera component, I'm all for it. I'm for spending the $5,000 for the cameras for sure because sampling costs me probably $25,000 a year because I'm always taking gear and I'm going places looking for a crab where there's nobody. And I never get to fish that spot by myself because somebody always goes through and samples it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, just since you're not looking at the, the presentation, Ben has been confirming what you're saying, you know, and we've heard it from others. I, I, we're hearing you about video, I just, um, and yeah, I just, it, that for us, that is the barrier um, to implementation. That is the, the, the system that we, we could not do that by December. Even no if, way. Even if you have a guy and you see a guy on my string and his hydraulics are working, you're never going to be, get a conviction in court. He'll just be like, oh, yeah, my deckhand was on the back deck screwing with the ram. It wasn't running good. And he he was just kept running it up and down. You know, they can yeah. lie because oh, if yeah. there's no camera component, you can't prove them wrong. They have to be proven guilty. And it's just the whole thing is just worthless without a camera component. Well, I just I don't think it's completely worthless, and and really this idea of revisiting this in a couple of years, where we could do video, um, is kind of what we're presenting here. You know, it's not off the table; it's just not doable by December 2024. I'm gonna. I know Ben's been typing typing madly and making but some really good comments in the chat. It's worthless to the fishermen. Yeah. Okay. I. Yeah. Okay. It's of no value to us. Um, go ahead, Ben. He's probably still muted. No, there we go. Now I'm back on. Uh, I was just going to say I agree with Kevin. I mean, it's uh, the uh, the EM program without cameras. It's it, it helps, and I know it gives you guys more tools, but it doesn't eliminate the problem. I mean, we got guys out there that uh, they're they're criminals, right? And uh, they're going to find every loophole that, that they're allowed 
to go. They're going to file for their three day extensions or whatever they are, you know, that is. And they're going to lay strings right next to us. I, I have a guy, I'm not going to name the boat name, but he lays five pot strings right next to us all season long. Uh, and he runs our gear. Um, there's nothing we can do about it because without video evidence, nowadays, if you don't have them with your, your colors of your buoy in their block, uh, you, we can't get a conviction. I mean, and I, I feel bad for Captain Chadwick and, and, and Sergeant uh, 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 Brian, um, whatever his last name is. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, I feel sorry for them because I know they, they want to do the right thing, but they can't. They don't have the tools. The tool they need is video cameras on every hall station showing what pots are coming through the block. I mean, that, that would eliminate the problem. And I understand it's, it's probably not uh, something that can be done by this December. So maybe we put, yeah, in, this, yeah. so we put in the EM thing this, this December and we work on getting cameras mandatory. That's the only way we're going to clean this fishery up, get all the criminals out of it. Uh, like guys like me and Kevin who are just trying to make a, make a, make a living for ourselves and, and feed our families and, and the guys that work for us. But let's go out there and work hard and make money again. Because it's right now it's just, it's just highway robbery out there all season long from the from start to finish. Um, we we do a lot of gear salvage. N not trying to toot my own horn, but we do a lot of gear, gear salvage, and we give all the pots back of people that we know. We call every pot that we pick up, we give them back to them. Uh, we we could keep them legally, but we don't, because that's the way I was, I was that's the way I was brought up. That's the way I was taught. That's the way the fishery should be. Uh, and it's uh, we, we're getting robbed blind, and we can't survive this way. And uh, and this electronic monitoring is great. I, I'm all for it. You know, but let's get stuff in there. But five thousand dollars is nothing. I get I get that taken from me daily during the winter time. Uh, by not by having other people run my gear. And that's that's all I'm saying. So let's get what we got going now and push forward. But but I want that video monitoring somewhere in the future, very near future, on the table because that's the only way you get buyback from us is uh, to show us how it's going to benefit us. Okay, I, I really appreciate that. Thanks for recognizing that we need time to to figure out video and how that would work. I, I really appreciate these comments and what it means to you. I, I've heard from I've heard from the advisors and this fleet or talking to people on the phone that at times, you know, yeah, this this issue is is powerful and um, problematic. So. Um, the one thing that we talked about at the industry meetings that I wanted to share with folks that weren't at the industry meetings, when we were looking, especially with the system, the pilot system we were testing, um, this Archipelago Lime system would be ideal if you could add a video component to it down the road, but it's not additive. They're completely separate systems. So you if you did something, you, you had a non-video system, you would have to replace it with a video system. It's not something you could just, you know, plug the camera in to your existing system. And it's because of hardware and that kind of thing that's needed for the video component. I, I mean, that would be so ideal to get at this idea that Ben has put in the chat where, yeah, let's do EM now with this, the simple GPS and hydraulic pressure sensor, and then you know add video later. And I just want to be very transparent about the fact that it's not, you would have to get a whole new system. It, it would be a, a cost and then. Do we have, do we have, we have another? Uh, do we have another question? Yeah, Yeah, thanks, Matt. And I mean, that's exactly why we, we've said right from the get-go, as soon as we, you know, we met with Pacific States, we met with enforcement, we met with our our IT program, when we realized we couldn't do video for this year, we made that up front, you know, so that you all know. Let me see. I'm going to look at who's got hands up. I got a question. Greg has had his hand up for is quite a while. Is theft really a big issue up here? Do you know who's doing it to you? 
Well, yeah, a lot of times. Excuse me? Yeah, a lot of times you know who's doing it. Well, I'm not afraid to mention names. When I was fishing, I know Dennis Sturgill robbed me blind. <laughs> I'm not afraid to tell him. Yeah. In fact, he stole pots. One time he had 28 of my pots on his boat in Warrington. I went and called the cops, and I told them, there's 28 pots on his boat, and I want them back. And they said they couldn't find a goddamn boat. It was tied in a slip. I lost 28 pots that day for sure. And I know went to dock with his boat because I got a call. I went over there, checked, called the cops, told them I want my gear back, and I want him prosecuted for it. They said, oh, I can't find the boat. Jesus Christ. That's the other thing about, you know, a camera component. And you talk about storage and going out there. I can I can narrow down a window. I'll say, okay, I think it was this boat. It's all, almost like the game Clue, you know, sort of hey, Professor Plum right. in the study with the candlestick. Mm -hmm. I can name you the boat. I can tell you the time frame, and then you would be able to look at the the digital location component. Then you could just go to his boat, and you could watch that, and you could see him sampling my gear, and then subsequently laying me down because sampling gear is illegal. A lot of guys do it. I've never sampled anybody's gear ever. And I take a lot of pride in that. I find my own crab. And, but that's more costly than people running your gear. Because if you're getting 20 to the pot and they lay one right on top of you on either side, it's gonna drop you to 10 or eight. You know, you're just not gonna catch them. I still don't, Ben asked the question, how will it benefit us? And that's really, I haven't heard how it will benefit the fishermen yet. How will it benefit us? That's an important question. Well, aside from not having to do log books and having good, good fishing location data, which we will, you know, be able to use to enforce SMAs, that we can do. We can enforce pot limits that we can do. That's a benefit to you. Well, the thing about <coughs> crab fishing, it's not like a dragger where you're going out and dragging a net along and catching crab. If somebody's fishing in an SMA, they'll usually get reported because yeah, we see, you know, I, I, I was fishing up the island last year and I could see that, oh yeah, there's guy fishing in the SMA, so I called it in, and they basically made them leave the SMA, which is fine, but your pots are out there. Anybody could go and verify that, oh, here's that pot. You don't need to monitor a vessel to see if they're fishing mm -hmm. in a closed area because their pots will be there. Yeah, I, okay, gotcha. On the, I want to say to the idea that you're saying, this window of time it wouldn't take a lot of data because I, I know right right where it would be. So you don't have to store all the extra data. The problem is we would have to, if we require the data to be collected, one, we have some requirement to review a certain portion of that data. And then once we collect it, we have the obligation to hold on to it for a certain amount of time, especially if there's a violation on it, then that time frame is, is a little bit longer. And so, yeah, maybe it's us getting our hand, a handle on, on what is the minimum that we would need to do to be effective with video. But again, what Pacific State said, it's not a matter of putting the data in the cloud or in a storage area. That's relatively inexpensive. It's being able to access it. From there, that's when it gets wildly expensive. And we're talking 200 boats with days and months, nine months of fishing data on hard drives is, is really a lot. But that's, you don't need all the data. The boats that get violated, they can tell you it took place, I think it was this boat and it was between this time and this time. You could pull that data. I would gladly sit and watch through days of it if we could catch the people that <laughs> stole $25,000 yeah. from me. You know, it just, and the logbook thing, it's like, 
So we're paying all this money just so that we don't have to do logbooks. That's the only thing you've said so far that is really of a benefit to us. And still, like you said, you're still going to have to specify, I caught this much in this area, this much in this area. And, and it's kind of irrelevant because sometimes some gear is really good, some gear is really bad. So if you're fishing two areas, you just have to trust the fisherman. There's no other way. The only way it's going to help is if the guy's only fishing in one area outside the UNA and then reports that he was in or all, all his gear in the UNA and reports that he was out. Mm -hmm. But that's not a benefit to us. You know, that's what's the benefit, what's in it for us? The camera part that is a colossal benefit to us. Colossal. Because I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, it's almost like, okay, you go, so go ahead and keep writing a $25,000 check to the thieves every year. Because that's essentially what we do, but the cameras could stop that. I've been for cameras forever. Okay, well, hearing you all on the cameras, I'm going to move on just because we're getting close. I, I'm I got it, got it. Um, so I'll go to Greg and then Jennifer. So, so yeah, I, I guess you answered the big part of my question was if these things were compatible with the ones that we have on the boat. So basically you're saying that even the ones that we have on the boats right now, the guys that are testing that aren't video, they're no good if we go to video. And, and that's a, that's a big, I mean, and then, and then I've got a, uh, another question leading into this is I've been dealing with this commission a lot. Are they on board with this? You know, are they going to be happy with what you're proposing? Because after all, they're making the decision. Are they going to turn around to you field and say, well, we want the video and we want everything else as well? Because that's always the hardest thing for us. You know, um, is I know you're saying that, but they're making the rules, and and right now, you know, I you, I don't have to tell you guys, but it's not a really friendly commission to industry right now, all around, and so that's a yeah. big question to me as, as well. And if if that's so, if 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 they're going to to encourage, well, we need the video part of it. And, and, and with you guys, what you're saying right now in a few years down the road, you might implement that. Then that's another huge expense. If these, if these ones that we're using right now are not compatible with video, that's, and then you're asking us to do this again in a few years, along with all the rope markings, along with everything else. I mean, it's, 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 it's a lot of money to swallow. Um, you know, that, that it, it just keeps, keeps coming year after year. So, I mean, I would definitely, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. It, it just seems like we're pushing a lot of stuff and then we're saying, well, in a couple of years, we might do the video. Sounds like the guys up North want video side of, it. you know, I mean, uh, so it's, you know, it's going to be. I think if you turn around in a few years and say, okay, we're, we're ready for the video side. Now you guys get to buy a $5,000 machine on top of the one you just bought a couple years ago. That, that might cause a problem. I, I would think that's, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, something to, to look at. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. In terms of the commission, um, that's, you might not have been on the line when I said this, but that's really why we had our industry meetings last week summer and fall to start talking about this we you know it's it would be i i completely agree it would be um we want to go to the commission and and we generally have had these stakeholder meetings had these industry meetings before we go to the commission to iron out these types of things so we don't go to the commission with the agency and the industry in conflict you know proposing something and, and we also don't want industry going to the commission saying, we want video, we want video. And putting that on on us, I mean, maybe that's one way to do it. We, we don't have the resources to do video. And right. I'm well, not, that, that's, my, so, that's my main concern is just like you just yeah. said was, you know, uh, because 
you know, I don't know how many times we've gone to a commission meeting and thought we had everything ironed out and they throw a wrench in everything. You can ask all those people at region six right now with their salmon policies, right where you're at. And you can, they'll tell you that. So, no, I, I mean, I you know, it, it, it happens a lot. And that's why I, I'm concerned about, you know, if we come together and we say, okay, we're going with this. And then they want something different. And then all of a sudden here we are October and we've got a whole different plan. You know, that's, that's, going to be a problem. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Go ahead, Jennifer. Uh, yes, I I don't recall at the last industry meeting that you said video that you made clear that video could not be implemented by December. Um, I thought that's why we were testing it. That's why it was being tested to see what and I believe that the industry has said we want the video. You're you're the one saying we don't have the resources for it, but we we are saying we want the video. I I want to know if I'm I'm concerned if we get the EM now without the video, we will never get the cameras yep. because the cameras benefit the fleet and the EM benefits you, and we we'll never get the videos if we get EM now without the video. That's my big biggest concern. And I want to know what are other fisheries doing to save their data? There's other fisheries with cameras. Can, can we not be problem solvers? Can we not, couldn't we have data for two to three weeks and then you record over it? Because in that two to three weeks, you would have your issues and you would address them. And then you just keep, recording over after a short period of time. I'd, I'd like to see us be more open to solving the problems. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Just a couple things. So one, at the industry meeting, what we said was we were interested in, te in testing it. What I responded to when we said, as soon as we knew we couldn't implement it in December, we included that in the letter so you would know sooner than later. So. What we said at the industry meeting was that these line systems, it can't be, you just plug in video when you're ready. So it's not like you can buy phase one and then add phase two. Um, in terms of being problem solvers, we're all up for it. That's what this slide that's on the screen, maybe you can't see it says, we want to, this is not off the table. We want to look for solutions. Um, we're not trying to just serve ourselves here. If we were, we wouldn't be holding this meeting. We're interested in what you have to say. We're hearing you say you want video and we are willing to look for how we can do that down the road. Um, it, we cannot do it by December. And as soon as we had those meetings with enforcement, with our IT, with Pacific States who said they want nothing to do with video, then we, we knew we had a bigger barrier in front of us than we had realized when we met with you last summer. So yeah, we're all for testing it to make sure that it, it can be compatible, but we hit some roadblocks that we cannot get over by December. Well, why not wait and do it? I mean, why not do it right the first time and not have fishermen have to pay for two systems to get there? I mean, why? why yeah, I, that's what I'm hearing, Hillary. I, I mean, that's, that's what I'm hearing from you, Paul. Um, one, the systems that provide the GPS and the hydraulic pressure sensor, I'm hearing from one end, you're like, you would gladly pay $5,000 for a system, but even though these other systems are less than $1,000 probably, that's, you don't want to pay for that because it doesn't give you, it doesn't give any benefit to the industry. I, I'm hearing that. Um, Plus the monthly fees. Monthly fees. Yes. Yeah. Additional. Yeah, value. which you'll have no matter which yeah, system those, you get. That, no that system, be, there's no monthly fees. Yeah. Monthly, yeah. 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 No. yeah. Hey, so, hey, this is Greg again. I got a quick question. I'm sorry. Dale's sitting at the table right there. Dale, have you gotten out of your membership a lot of people that say they want a video side of this? Because I'm trying to think of the guys that I've been around. And they're not, which is around, you know, I fish the river here 
in Oregon. And I haven't heard this big push on that they want video on their boat. And I'm just asking Dale if he's heard it because I, I don't know as far as, I mean, I understand you guys want it big up, up, up north, but I'm not hearing that down on our end. He, what do you think? Uh, I agree with what Greg just said. Okay. On the other I was, I was wondering about it. that. Um, if it really is a couple of times folks have said, this is, this is a more of a need north of, is it north of Clipson or north of Chehalis? I don't know about the well, shade. I don't know where. Be, yeah, I, I mean, my my opinion is is is, you know, we 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 don't get into a lot of the tribal issues. There's a lot of your fleet that doesn't go up there. So, you know, I, I mean, I feel like a lot of times we're thrown into these regulations that benefit the SMAs and up there. And a lot of us don't even go north of the Clips and Line because we're fishing both sides. There's a lot to do. I, I will say that, but I'm just trying to figure out because. I'm not hearing that from the people that I'm talking to, that they're fired up on this video side of it, you know? So, and, and that's why I asked Dale, I mean, so that's, yeah, that's my, I mean, that, that's why I asked the question of how much that yeah. you really have up here. Right. I mean, yeah. one way to, if, if, as we think about phasing in video and how that would look, it could be, something like fishing north of Point Chehalis or north of Clipson Beach or north of somewhere. If you're going to fish up there, you must have a video system as one way to do it. Um, well, let's see. Um, we, uh, this has been a good discussion. I. I really appreciate it. I appreciate how many people have engaged um, in the discussion. So thanks for that. And thanks for um, sharing your, your real honest thoughts. Um, so we will think about that. Um, I do want to, I don't know if we're, we were gonna adjourn at 4.30. I've got a few other things to talk about. Um, and I can just run through those here really quick. Um, I wanted to share other components of the rulemaking. Uh, you wanna tip slide to that? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. So EM was just part of the rulemaking. Um, other rule proposals that are part of the package include um, line marking. So at these industry meetings last summer, we had people telling us that the way the, the rule was written was leading too many questions about what does, you know, what is a 12 inch red mark? And people brought in examples of someone shoving a zip tie in a couple of places in that 12 inches and asking if that works and really a request that we be more explicit and what is lawful and what isn't. So the um, the proposal here is right now we just have 12 inches of red. Um, the update to the rule would be adding the word continuous in there uh, just so that's more clear that it would need to be a continuous line throughout that 12 inches. You, you couldn't use a zip tie or six zip ties in that 12 inches. And then um, this second bullet here uh, is an idea. Oregon has already done this. Um, and the rule says, so for folks that need to understand why we're we are doing all this line marking and, and gear marking rules as we've heard relative to our risk reduction measures and our conservation plan. One of the key components of that will need to be a monitoring program. And the monitoring is really monitoring for entanglements. And the way we can do that, and we've gotten NIMS buy off on this concept is by having a really solid gear marking system across the West Coast. And so Washington has our red gear marking requirement. Oregon and California are pursuing um, gear marking requirements, but it only works if you it's unlawful to use the line in Washington anywhere else. So 
you wouldn't want someone in Oregon using a red a red line. So this this rule, and like I said, Oregon already has done this in their rulemaking. This rule would say that it's unlawful to use gear that has line marks consistent with the requirements for any state or federal fisheries other than, in this example, Dungeness crab. Um, but we are also, through this rule package, applying that to the spot shrimp and Puget Sound uh, shrimp pot. And all the rule is saying they can't use this 12 inch red mark because it's required for the Dungeness crab fishery. So that that actually really helps in terms of um, not having other other fisheries use the same same line marking that's required for crab. Are you still just only going to require the one red mark then instead of the two that you talked about earlier? Um, yeah, we weren't going to. So if you got a 12 inch red, bottom. that's good now. I think it says 12 inches at the top and 12 inches at the bottom. Because I know earlier you were saying you got to have a color to say it's Washington. But right. The red mark designates Washington. You don't need to be yes. red at it. It's a yes. lot of work. I think that's the one complaint I've got time and time again is. The marking, I don't really hear too much against the marking. It's just how much marking are we going to have to do? Mm -hmm. Because it can get excessive. Yeah. I'll tell you a little bit more about line marking in the long term here in a sec. Um, so then there's a buoy requirement. You know, the recreational crab fishery requires that you use red and white buoys. And this, this clarifies that in the commercial fishery, if your buoy is has red and white, 30% um, also needs to be another color. So we won't, we don't want to get the red and white buoys from the sport fishery. Um, want to separate them from the commercial fishery. Uh, log books not required when EM is functioning. Um, and then there's other, we're working with our Puget Sound uh, shellfish managers um, to also make some other minor rule clarifications focused on the Puget Sound shellfish fisheries. Um, and then what I wanted to share with you is some of this West Coast discussion that we've been having on line marking over the long term. Um, next slide. Uh, so we've been talking about this idea of having a state specific line. Um, and like Dale said, Washington has said we're red. Oregon is basically claimed yellow and California green. And then and then black along with red. And this is what you're getting at, Dale. When you saw the last proposal, it'd be like red and black. And that would say Washington, black would be Dungeness Crab. We're moving away from that, you're right. So um, but uh, what England Marine has done is uh, develop some state-specific line. And the concept here is that it would be phased in. So as you're replacing your line on your gear kind of organically, as you would normally do, you would replace it with the state-specific line. Um, Oregon and California are considering regulations to do that this year. Um, but the phase in would be like five years. So nothing would need to be done December 1, 2023. But by December 1, 2025, you would need to have, you know, I don't know if it's 100% of your, your lines in this line marking or some percentage of it. But it's, it's phasing it in so that it happens as you replace your line. We were thinking about this um, next year, just given that EM is a really big uh, bite of the apple. Um, and I have some pictures to show you what this line looks like. Um, England Marine has got uh, samples of this sent to California and the um, marine mammal entanglement. Oh, thank you, Robert. Entanglement uh, folks are kind of tested, look for fading that kind of thing, disability. Uh, for folks that are in the room, um, we, we got some actual samples to look at. So 
This is, Dale, the concept of red and white, or red and black. The white there is just because that's the buoyant line. It's a neutral. Neutral line. Neutral line. Yeah. How long before the red turns pink? Yep, that's what it has to be. But at least... Heather, it, Sheila, Sheila made it known that, that they can do that in any row. That's just... What they have there is just the neutral buoyancy. Hydro Pro. Okay. That's what's there. Yeah. That they can do silver Pacific, blue steel, anything in the colors that, that, that they need to be. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Greg. Um, they've been really fantastic. Go ahead, Kevin. So if a bunch of your line is a color that is one of the other state colors, would you no longer be able to use that line? Yeah. Unless you market i just spent fifteen thousand dollars online last year is it yellow or green it's <laughs> yellow <laughs> yeah all my, i've been built all brand new bottom shots that will last like 10 years for sure mm -hmm. they're yellow on the bottom and then you go to orange <coughs> or pro on the top yeah. jamie switch to the yellow see they've got the yeah black they've one. got a, a different colored tracer yeah. and that's like the official color then yeah. i could just use the plain yellow then that's fine i just yeah, hate it, to have to spend way more money yeah <laughs> so that's the example of oregon and then um california there those are two different colors of green slash blue that they're testing and and you're right larry that's exactly what they're testing is um fading at least if red fades to pink it won't look yellow or green. Yeah. Hey Heather. Hey this yeah. is, I've been using red bottom shots for a couple of years and they don't fade very much. Oh good to know. I got, I got red red bottom shots and red neutral buoyant top shots and they're not fading much at all, if anything. I mean they're still very much on the red spectrum and more on red than pink for sure after a couple three years oh good and, and if i was from california couldn't i just use a green tracer and if they use red can they put or could if we use you know they could use red bottom shots but they can put their color tracer just like this gentleman has yellow bottom shots why can't he use a red tracer not buy all new lines I need to, I need you to say that slow. <laughs> so good. Can you just say this bottom shot? Yeah. Red. Continue to mark. But I, the idea is eventually to phase out all of your line to this gear. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But so as you replace line, yeah. you just did. So obviously you would be on a. But sometimes you'll have like a pile of line that we have spliced that's literally being stored and it might get stored for five, six, seven years until we need it. And then it's like, okay, let's use these shots, you know? So then it would be, as long as we can still mark those, I, I'm all, I, this is easier than marking them. Right. And, but as long as, so the new stuff, as long as all the line companies, you know, Silver Pacific and Blue Steel and Hydro Pro and all those companies are going to produce a line that's color specific. That's great. It's just the, older ones we'd still need it would be nice to still be able to mark those my guys dip their hand and they put a glove on they dip their hand in red buoy paint and then they smear it on each one it actually lasts okay. for a whole year and it's faster than like trying to weave a thread in yeah but it's a little pain i like this oh. idea actually. well i i'm gonna i i haven't been tracking oregon's or california's proposed rules to understand these details, um, I'd like to, and um, but we did want to share this um, concept with you right away because we'll want to start thinking about it too. Uh, go ahead, Lorna. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, California and Oregon um, are both planning to. Um, require this as a phase in these um, after they test these colors. Um, I think because we already require the red mark 
it would make sense to allow that to be used um, while guys mm -hmm. begin to use the new line as they, mm -hmm. you know, replace gear, just as you were saying, organically. So I think um, during this phase-in period, if you're not purchasing that red-black line, you would still mark your line as you've been yeah. doing. Right, so, right. Thank you, yeah. I don't, yeah, and I don't think Oregon or California are taking that approach. I think um, they may be, um, but they are moving towards having this black and state-specific color required in a number, uh, I think it's either four or five years, depending on the state. When Kevin said that your line that you just bought in the last 10 years? Oh, a bottom shot, yeah, oh, okay. because it's half inch. Yeah, okay, I see. Yeah, I mean, that's getting a lot of life out of them, but some, you know, some of the boats only fish a month and a half. You know, it's not like when you start, if you start December 1st and you fish till September, 15th your line isn't going to last there yeah so, yeah right okay but yeah as long as we can still mark it yes. and then phase it in that yes. that seems fine okay the yeah. would love it not having a mark <laughs> yeah <laughs> um okay go ahead larry yeah thanks uh this has been a good conversation um i think it's really important to note at least as i understand it that this is an area where the National Marine Fisheries Service and NOAA has been pretty specific yeah. that if we are going to get an incidental take permit, there has to be a better way for the attribution of entanglements to a state and to a fishery. So that that is a fundamental piece of what we need in order to meet potentially getting that permit. Having said that, uh, I really appreciate what Lorna said that if indeed, and I do think that in the end, this is going to have to be a solution. It's going to have to be this line specific to each state. Mm -hmm. um, now, how, you know, whether we do exactly the same thing as Oregon and California, and I've, I've got their proposal. I just got it from uh, John, Jonathan Gonzalez. Um, oh, good. Okay. I'll send it to you. Um, okay. And I and I won't get into the specifics of it, but just generally, it would be like the, they're advocating the top twenty fathoms, including a trailer, would have to be this this line over time. Now, whether Washington agrees with that or not, I'm not completely sure. Maybe fifteen fathoms would work better for us, since there's a number of guys that fish through the season in really shallow water, uh, and twenty fathoms might be too much line, but. But the point is, this this will be, I suspect, the direction that we are going to have to go. And I really appreciate that we could phase it in so the cost wouldn't be uh, up front and for one season because the costs estimated in, in the data that I just got, it would cost 17, at today's prices, it would cost $17,000 for uh, HydroPro 500 pots um to do this and floating line would be nine thousand dollars so it's a significant yeah. expense and then you add that on top of the video camera potentially of five thousand dollars and then potentially a cost for evisceration fishery if indeed we need that tool i mean you're talking a pretty significant amount of money so yeah uh, phasing that in over time even for the video system hopefully <clears throat> or some way to get some help in the financing. When you add it all together, it's a pretty significant hit or potential uh, cost to the fishery. But, but that's, I just wanted to share uh, some of what I just, just recently got. And, uh, and then, like I say, I appreciate that we would, as Lorna proposed, have a phase in, so we're not requiring this to be transitioned quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we we debated the idea of putting it in this rule package just to to start giving people some certainty that they could start replacing the line. It it felt a bit much um, for that, and I I sure appreciate the the cost for this, and it is one area where I I think um, 
you know, there's a way on the West Coast to look for some kind of grants to help with this. Uh, kind of a side note, you know, we've all been um, lobbying for money to do the NEPA analysis for our incidental take permit. In some of the discussions we we had and we had the opportunity to, our directors had a discussion through the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, talk not only about this need for funding the NEPA, but need for implementing uh, our, our fishery requirements under an incidental take permit. It's going to cost money. And so um, anyway, I, I, I completely support the idea of looking for funding opportunities to help help the entire West Coast do this. Um, I, I think it's smart. Um, ben, the, the tribes don't have a color required, but what we've asked is that they include in their rule that similar provision that it's unlawful to use line required in the state crowd fishery to mark to use in their their fishery and um, they've been open to that idea. So. Oh I had um, there just one more thing I just wanted to add. I did I didn't mention in the proposal uh, and it's just a proposal at this juncture but um, seems like they're leaning heavily towards this at, from what I understand. There would not be a mark or a requirement for this line at the at the pot. It would it would be the top 20 fathoms. But like I said earlier, you know, in Washington and spring summer, there's guys are going to fish lines that are maybe even shorter than 20 fathoms. So it would be continuous in that regard later. Oh, OK. OK. Uh, Greg, you have your hand up. Do you have another question? Yeah, I got it on, on this line marking thing. Um, the one thing I would like for you guys to try to do is, is I, I think it's great that you're phasing it in and all that because that's what we've been trying to do since it started, have a state-specific line, and I think that's great. Um, you know, it just stinks that, you know, we it could have been done a few years ago. But anyway, regardless, I would just like for you guys to to encourage you guys to work with the state of Oregon and California and you guys come up, you can have different colors, but make it a uniform standard between the states because you've got a huge portion of your fleet that fishes both states are, you know, different up and down and just make it uniform to where there's no confusion when you're putting your gear together, that this mm -hmm. goes to this, that goes to that, and there's no different links. If they, you know, work together, that's the main thing. Don't go out on and do your own thing. And, you know, I mean, because you, we're all under the same blanket, all the states. So let's just, I, I would just encourage you to work with Oregon and California or whatever. And just, if you come up with links, if you're coming with state specific, uh, state specific line, just make it the same. That's, that's what I think you do. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Greg. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Hey, um, something else that needs to be thought about, too, is um, remember we got a lot of Washington folks that buy line from LFS and Seattle Marine. I buy a lot from LFS. And if there's some way the state could reach out to the vendors, and if you're going to make a state specific line, you know, sending letters out to different buyers or figuring out who's who instead of, you know, so they can start re, uh, reconfiguring their line. It's not the same for Marine, you know, there's a lot of a lot of other major players that sell lines, but I think that Okay. I I didn't hear all of what you said, but I think you're saying make sure there's a wide range of vendors that have this line available, they not just a couple. Too. Okay. Oh, okay. But sorry, I, I was on my Bluetooth. I was listening on Bluetooth and then yeah, no, there's just a lot of vendors in Seattle, like LFS and Seattle Marine and some other side ones that, you know, sell a lot of crab line to the upper end fleet. I buy it from LFS, and yes, so the state needs to make a big push to uh, you know, start kind of showing the other vendors what, what you guys are doing so they can okay. get on board to you. Gotcha. All right.
Okay. Now, Greg, is that a new hand up? No, sorry about that. But I just like okay. to tell Matt thing. Um, I think the manufacturers, I think she's just going to the manufacturers. So I think they're all very aware of what's going on. But I understand what you're saying about the vendor side of it. But uh, so I think the manufacturers know. I think they just, uh, what's going on with that. Okay. Hey, hey, Heather, this is Hank again. Yeah. I'm not on video. But what What is the line that you're you're talking about? Uh, state specific for Washington. What does it look like? I'm not. I'm not. I don't see that. It's like three strand line, two uh, two reds and one black. Oh, okay. There's a red. There's a there's a tracer that's involved. Yeah, it's uh, black black tracer why, and red line. Oh, why the black tracer? I mean, man line makes red line already, and there is a high, there is a neutral buoyancy line that is already red. Um, the so you have to have a yeah, the black is the two colors, the the red and black, the green and black, and the yellow and black. The black identifies the crab fishery. The red or the yellow or the green identifies the state. That's the concept. And then that way it can expand to other fleets. And that's how you really get to that fishery attribution that uh, Larry did a really good job of explaining what, what we're trying to do and why why NIMS has, I mean, this is like one thing that they have been quite clear about. Um, so that's that's the purpose of that, Hank. I see. So, oh, okay, I just didn't see it. So I thought you were talking about making Washington just have red, but I see you're, you're specific to the fishery as well. Yeah. So if you have a bunch of red line, can you put a black chaser in it? I got a lot of red line thinking you guys weren't going to do this. So uh, anyway, no. Okay. I'm, I'm now I'm visually seeing you guys are talking about. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any hands up. Let's go end the day with a crab fishery update. So I um, wanted to give you guys an update on where we are catch-wise and part sharing and all of that. So what's what we're showing on the screen right now is the, the catch through um, May 8th uh, by area and the state total through May 8th is 22.8 million pounds. And um, there, the Quinault has landed 4.2 million pounds. Quileute has landed 109,000 pounds. Macaw has landed almost 63,000 pounds. Uh, Ho has landed about 2,500 pounds. And that makes the total state and tribal landings through May um, 27.2 million pounds. Uh, the state fishery value, so just based on the state landings, is at uh, 58.7 million dollars. Um, uh, go ahead, next slide, Jamie. Thank you. Where we are with Quinault, um, this is again through May 8th. The state has caught um, 5.1 million pounds of crab in the Quinault UNA. Quinault has caught 4.2 million pounds in the UNA. Um, the interesting thing that you can't see uh, for folks that are calling in or not on your computer. You know, May 1 in the in the Quinault UNA, we implemented the additional pot reduction. And uh, what you can see here is that at least through May 8, the state landings in the Quinault UNA are 96,000 pounds, 96, 299 pounds, and the Quinault landings are 80,422 pounds. So what I saw from this um, to me was uh, at least the first indication that the pot limits, you know, had some effect of um, 
kind of balancing that or, or stopping the, at least in the Quinault UNA, the, the disparity between the state and Quinault catch. Um, but when we looked a little further and Jamie did work on this, um, what we saw is that between then there were in April there were 63 vessels fishing in the Quinault UNA and in May there were 33. Uh, so we reduced effort. So when I had a meeting with Quinault um, yesterday, walked them through this and you know they're they're a big uh, what they wanted to know is is it <coughs> effective and I think from this and from the effort data I think it's clear to me that it, it's an effective way of providing additional opportunity to Quinault um, because there's half as many vessels with 40% uh, reduction. So there's there's room to fish and there's room to fish um, in the Quinault UNA. Uh, what's the next slide? I don't remember. Okay, and then here, um, this next slide is just showing that um, in the harvest sharing, this is just state and Quinault in the in the Quinault UNA. Uh, the state is at 54.8, basically 55, and Quinault is at 45%. Um, so the difference is um, just about 900,000 pounds um, and that when we look at the projection tool, um, we can end up anywhere between 57 and 60%. Um, so again, we met yesterday. So in my mind, the way I'm thinking about this, and I, I put together a summary just for myself and went back to 2012, 2013, and I lined up um, harvest sharing and it and the management measures that we've used both the state and Quinault and what I've really been focused on thinking about here is the idea that you know at some point we're sharing pretty close to 50 50 in certain years of uh, low abundance the state is falling behind in years of high abundance Quinault is falling behind. Um, the difference between looking at those two is, of course, in high abundance, there's still crab to be caught right now, where in low abundance years, you know, there's virtually nothing to be caught. And But what, what I was thinking about, you know, where the, the response from Quinault is really that this is some really exceptional year. And, and yes, it's a high abundance year, but to me, it doesn't really fall outside of the, the range of what we've seen over these last 10, 12 years. And the actions that we've taken are very much in line with the actions taken by both of our parties. We're using the tools that we, we have, we're implementing them very similarly in these periods of high, super high abundance and super low abundance. Uh, I will tell you, Quinault is not seeing that way. Um, and I, um, just to, to share with you too, so not before this meeting, but before the last meeting I had with Quinault, um, their attorney had reached out to our AG's office and just said, you know, we, we need to talk. Our, our clients are um, having issues with the way they've been handling in-season management and it was pretty clear that um, what their attorney, the information their attorney had, did not reflect everything that we did. So when I talked to our AG's office, I said, well, one, we've done this, 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 and this. And uh, um, so we just replied back. It, you know, they said, well, well, what action is the state going to take to avoid litigation kind of thing? And um, I told our AG's office, I didn't intend to do anymore. We had just implemented this 40% pot reduction in the Quinault UNA and let's, yeah, you know, not going to do anything before seeing how that works. So that's where I say, looking at this data, it's like, okay, that was a, that was a meaningful action. It, at least, you know, in that first week, it, um, 
it was meaningful. And and you can see that the I had told Pranal too, there's a, a role for them to play in, in this balancing harvest sharing when there's crab on the grounds is they need to keep fishing because it's not we don't need to match our effort to their effort. Anyway, the conversations that you've all heard over many, many years, we're all saying the same thing. Um, so then again, before this meeting yesterday, their AG work reached out to our AG's office and again said, um, and this is even before our update had come out, they said, well, the state's at 55% and it looks like it's that sharing is just gonna continue growing. Um, our pay, our client has been, um, is losing, losing their patience or something like that. And so, uh, anyway, the response back from our AG was we, we again, we took this action, we reduced the pot limit by 40% in the salt UNA. There's a 50% reduction in the number of vessels there. We're providing the opportunity as we're required to do. Um, and uh, so anyway, the, the conversation with Cornell yesterday was, uh, again, they're, they're really, um, it's really clear that they have, they, they don't have the history of how we've gotten from our management agreements 20 years ago to what they are now or 15 years ago to what they are now and where we're really managing around 50-50 and, you know, my idea that this is not incredibly exceptional um it's just a high abundance year and then leaning back on this thing that we really tried to advocate with with Quinal and our new policy team is we need to sit down and it's not just you that wants to figure out what we do in high abundance season it's us we want to figure out how to do better when it's a low abundance season when we can't catch up even though they they completely shut down their fishery we still can't catch up so uh, a real, they, um, I just wanted to share that they had a recommendation uh, to consider, which is expanding the SMA to uh, 50 fathoms on the west and to Hogan's Corner on the south. And, and then again, brought up the idea that, you know, to consider closing the fishery. Uh, and I said, I am in no way entertaining the idea of closing the fishery. Um, and I didn't really say much more than that. I basically said, thank you for your proposal. And we just are eight days into a pretty significant, um, action on our part and, you know, let's see how it goes. And I also was very clear that there's no way that they're going to catch 800,000 pounds, even if we do stop, neither one of us is going to catch 800,000 pounds between now and the end of the season. So. Um, they're, they were really, uh, they really pushed back hard on when, when would I get back to them? Uh, and I, I just, I left it really wide open. I, I mentioned that I was meeting the, with the crab industry today and one would be sharing this with them. Um, and, um, yeah, I left no no indication that I would or would not be doing anything, but just uh, would be getting back to them. We have another meeting next week. We've basically been meeting every week since, I don't know. Day 30. Uh, <laughs> basically since day 30 of our fishery. Yes, you're right? right. Yeah, you're right. So anyway, that's that's the update. How many boats do they have fishing now? Um, I don't know how many Which boats is. they have, but... Um, uh, if they, if they have their... Yeah. No, that's fine. Oh, well, I mean, I think, I mean, I guess as we all know, and I mean, their effort is increased with the price increase. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's what Larry, you know, and everybody touched to is that, I mean, yes, we did the reductions and some guys quit and everything, but it pretty much comes down to the price up to five bucks and all of a sudden they're at the cannery every day and loading, even, I mean, even my cannery is you know, owned by Quinault, I guess, but I mean, they're even like, oh, they're going fishing every day, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, they're getting paid now, so they want to leave the dock again, but yeah, I mean, most of their boats are talking about quitting now. I mean, you might have one or two guys fishing here in the next two weeks, from what I understand, but yeah, okay. once again, it all comes down to that they quit. You know, they 
with the price of fishing, they just weren't going to fish for two dollars. And that's, I mean, literally, if they would have fished, you know, the same, it would have been the same if they would have just kept their effort like they did. And that's what it all comes yeah. down to. I mean, they just they just showed that that they can do that when they actually try, and with not even some of the high power guys trying. You know, they caught the same almost as us last month. So, I mean, that's the difference. I mean, yes, maybe a little bit of reduction did, but I mean, overall, they just actually had type in the dog. That's, that's, okay. that's the bottom line of the story from my aspect is they stay on time from the dock. <laughs> you know, seeing that. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And, and so so what I've teed up is this idea, I keep coming back to it, that we need to sit down and have this discussion about not not overhauling the approach that we're taking, but finding um finding ways to, to use our in season tools to, to achieve our goals achieve goals when it's high above the season and achieve our goals when it's super low because it's the same conversation when the tables are turned how do we do this better we're not going to figure it out right now so let's meet um this summer and sit down and 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 work through it and they've been open to that but um yeah it's been We'll we'll do that. That is part of the plan, but it's it's uh, still what what are you going to do now? And they're very very focused on crab for crab and fifty percent, and uh, they're not looking at fifty percent of the harvestable surplus and which is the requirement. And uh, I just think this might be the new policy team. Having not worked through it uh, before, this is their first time working through this. Um, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, Larry. Well, I appreciate the uh, approach you're taking. Um, I'm not completely sure how uh, supportive the AG's office is by what you've said so far, but I got the impression that they were uh, understanding or trying to understand what it was you were presenting. And, and historically, uh, uh, you know, the balance is, has been over the past is it 11 years or so throwing out, well, you'd have to almost throw out last year's craziness on the catch reporting but over time the quinaults actually are ahead so now we are going to be ahead there's just no two ways about that but there's also just no two ways about it this is the highest production year ever on record um, uh, that i recall i think there was 25 million pounds a while back um, there was 22 million like way back um, and occasionally in the 20, but never 27 million total for the state. So I know. there's I know. no there's no way you can achieve the goal of 50-50 when you have uh, such swings in abundance on every year. But in balance, uh, you're meeting your obligations. Um, yeah. and, and we also need to remember that we don't just share with Quinault there. Now, the last few years, there's hardly been any participation by Quileute in the fishery. Uh, but this year, they've actually participated more. And in the, historically, we used to attribute about half of their catch uh, south of uh, Destruction Island. But I think the last few years, they've actually reported specifically what they caught. But there were prior years where Quinault caught 300,000 pounds plus south of DI. Um, uh, well, at least for their combined season, anyway. I might be wrong on a 300,000 south of DI, but it was significant. And and I don't I don't hear any mention, even though it's not that much this year. 100 and some thousand divided by two, let's say 50, and oh, at 2,500, but 55,000 pounds. But it's still you know, it's like they think they get 50% all the way from Point Chehalis to DI, and they don't. And some years again, Quileute, if they get a fleet built up again, will be a more significant piece of this division. And then, as you have said, over time, I mean, there were two years when Kronald had 60% of the crabs, two years in a row, 
when the volume was less, less than 3 million pounds, even less than 2 million pounds one year uh, total from Point Chehalis to DI. So, um, you know, the, the idea that they just, doesn't matter, we should have 50% of what's caught, not what's harvestable, and that you should just shut your fishery down or have more area. One, they aren't going to utilize it, and two, it isn't going to get us to another place other than just penalizing the guys that are finally uh, recovering from this low price year this year. So um, uh, what I do see, though, is we are going to have to re-examine the head start and, and what it means when we get uh, catches for Quinault at the level they were getting this year, that it may mean we have to add two or three you know, some time to the head start based on that. Uh, and I, but I certainly hope we stay away from any SMA uh, adjustments. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks, Larry. Um, well, I had a thought, but I, I, I lost it. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, just a little bit of info. When they, when you expanded the SMA to be to the secondary SMA, the tribe fishermen, they don't move in there. And in fact, Dave Wolfenberger asked one of them that was unloading, he's like, oh, are you going to move into the expanded SMA? And he's like, no, it's already fished out. So it's really that policy is just purely punitive mm -hmm. on us to keep us from catching as many crab. And it doesn't, they don't necessarily move in there yeah. at all. I was going to ask about, that is a question, and I, I asked Cleve, I said, is is all of that 80,000 pounds coming from the SMA? Is no one, you know, but they want out to the 50 fathoms. Is is there anybody out there now? And, and he said there might have been one boat, but they got their gear tampered with. Um, but then I know we have a lot of in common fishing south of Copalis or south of the southern boundary, and that's pretty pretty regular for those fleets. But just, I was trying to get at what what good would it do? Because in my mind, I was like trying to come up with these ideas and like, let's just remove the SMA and let everybody fish. Let us move around, let them move around. I it, it's, a, it's a dead on arrival idea, I know, but the, the idea was, what is an SMA? We don't know. And um, well, they, was, their claim is that they fished it out. They and fished that, the SMA out? Then that's why they need the SMA out to 50 fathoms and down to Hogan's Corners, because they, yeah, they, they fished out the SMA. And, and, and it, it my memory is that this is about the time of year, or maybe in a month or so, when crab will start moving into the near shore with only three vessels fishing in the UNA, not corking that western boundary line. You know, plenty of crab can move in over shallow, right? But, but you're exactly right, Kevin, when uh, the idea of moving from Rock River to Split Rock came up, and I said, we, of course, will keep that. At, uh, Rock River, they're like, well, yeah, we'll keep there, but it doesn't do us any good. That's all rocks. So it was just, and I, I say again, you know, like, it's not going to do us any good if you, if you keep it closed or, or open, because we're not going to fish there, but it was just sort of, we just, but keep it closed. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm really putting a lot of, um, faith in this idea that we get together and have a good conversation over the summer about what do we do next year. We're very, very threatening about what any further inaction on our part will set us up for next year. Um, you know. But how do you, I just don't understand. I mean, how do you make a plan for once in every 20, 30 year event? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean you go ahead. You go, I mean, they'll be like, okay, give us 60 days next year and they catch every crab. And then how do they compensate the state, the state for that? I mean, if you give them a bigger head start next year and it's a little abundance here, I mean, there's not one crab left on the North Beach. It's just, I just, 
I mean, and they'll be like, oh, that's too bad for the state. Even, I mean, no matter what, those guys always make money. They get rich. They got all their crap at a, at a higher price, but so they go and catch all the crab day next year because they're, we're trying to compensate. And then it's like, so who compensates the state fishermen that's going to lose everything because I, mean, so I don't know how you. I mean, it was a losing proposition to this year. Like I said, last year was a wash because of the bad data, but and they had some boats broke down, or else. And this this year, if they just would have tried, it's just it's just some. You're trying to make it's just hard to make data off of when one side's not consistent. I mean, our fleet's mm-hmm. consistent, theirs not, so you can't you can't make data. I mean, like last year we had well we had bad data, unfortunately, but I mean they had broke down boats, so those broke down boats have been fishing. What would the outcome of last year been? And this year, if they just would have tried, the price wouldn't have been, you know, in the toilet. What would the outcome been? So it's just, I just don't even know how you start to make a data or a plan. <laughs> and it's just, I just don't know how you even tackle this problem because it's just yeah, a rare event. Matt, I think you're, yeah, one second, Larry. Matt, I think you're making some really good points that the only way to look at the data and use the data is to use all of the data. So we don't know how many vessels, we don't actually get that, we know landings. We know they have about 30 vessels, I think, but really that's it. But we to, to be able to make some meaningful predictions about their early season harvest rate, it would have to include number of vessels, weather, price, all of that, and then look back over um, kind of this baseline 10, 12 years where we really have seen their fleet have this ability to catch 50% or more. Um, but it, the thing that always bothers me is we're doing 50% of poundage, but it's it's all about making dollars. I mean, I'm sure they're, well, I'm not sure, but I would guess they're over 50% on the, the dollars of vessel landings. Do you think? And why can't we make an issue out of that when we meet with them? Look, you've already made 53% of the money pulled off the grounds. They were very offended when I brought up. Because it's a good point. When I That's up why. Up the price. And because, again, this this particular policy crew is very focused on that 50. And so to me, that's where I'm investing and willing to invest in these bigger conversations with them um, and the understanding of what what is the federal requirement it's it's not it's not one crap for crap and um, anyway though it'll take some work to 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 get there um, but but I know this could be some serious growing pains for the north side but I'll tell you one thing you should say Heather there's nothing in the Rafiti decision or the bull decision that says they get to go first we always have that option to go first there's no guarantee. I mean, yes, it I means we get to go out and throw pots out for five days, and then they would get to go. But there is always that. And if it comes down to that, I don't know what the Northside fleet thinks of it anymore. But if I was still fishing, I'd say the same thing. Is it be a proof yeah. point? So they are not entitled to first. We let them go first because it makes it simple. But we don't have to play by those rules. And I think that's what the Northside fleet's going to have to have a heart to heart with themselves. And, you know, they want to start playing this game. We can go first one year and see how much they like to go behind us. You know, it, it might mean moving our entire gear and fishing south and completely screwing up the Washington fishery, but I think that, that would be my red line at some point. Would be, okay, well, there's something in the law that says we can't go first. That's how I feel. Yeah. Well, I'll just say, I know, Larry, you want to say something. I'll just, I'll just say for you all now as we have these discussions and um, throughout the summer leading up to next year, uh, and as I said at the last meeting too, they'll involve the advisory board and industry members as we think about how how we you know just dig into this issue uh, with them. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, thanks. So uh, just a couple things. Uh, one, I'm not advocating a change in the Head Start because they because of this year's season. I am advocating that we need to look at the sliding scale. As a piece of what you're suggesting, which I know you appreciate, but I'm not sure if others understood that. So okay. it, would, it would be reflective of what the catch rate seems to indicate whether we would or wouldn't increase 
head start days uh, for Quinault next year, but it would be with, you know, there may be a need to revisit the formula, uh, the range of what the head starts are. Right now, it's just, what is it, 45 to 47 days. I mean, it may yeah. be 43 to 48 or 49, yeah. potentially. That's Those are the things that I'm talking about. And then the other thing, the idea that we could go ahead, we can't go until the crabs reach 23%. And we can't go ahead of December 1, unless we're going to revisit Tri-State and completely do everything differently there, like fish on crabs less than 23%. So we can't arbitrarily decide to go fishing ahead of them. They can go when they want. In the beginning, we can't. And that's that's just the reality of that. Yeah, I agree. Well, I think you made a good point when we talk about 50% of the har harvestable surplus. We catch 50% of what's harvestable. If they don't put any effort to catch their half, that's on them, not on us. And right now, all of the management is about us catching less crab, not about them catching more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was the the start of the conversation with in back in in March when and things you know changed so fast in harvest sharing for the state fleet. Um, but it that was exactly the part of the conversation of when we don't know what that surplus is. It's, yeah, us stopping isn't the solution. Or, or the requirement. So, um, anyway, that's that's keeping you all up, up to date. I don't have any more for today. Uh, we got a ton of input today. Thank you. <laughs> to figure out. How, uh, what to do with all of that. So thanks everybody for, um, yeah, this was a really jam packed three hours. Um, so thanks, thanks for coming here to the office. Thanks for everybody who's online. And um, yeah, I don't, I guess I'm not sure um, if we'll have another meeting or or what we'll do going back to the rulemaking um, before we file our CR 102, but we'll definitely be thinking about the input from today. So thank you. I'm already half an hour late for my next meeting. <laughs> but I do want to talk about the demonic acid gel and how to get that passed. Yeah, I appropriately. Okay. I, I, I don't to. have 